longer on the list of most segregated cities in the United States. However, the lasting impact of racial segregation and the division that ensued remains, and it oftentimes seems um, even more ingrained than ever. The questions, three questions, and you'll have one minute to respond. What will you do about the lasting impact of racial segregation in Kansas City? Describe your style of leadership where, relative to issues of race. More specifically, how will you govern during those conflicts over policy where race may be an underlying issue? And the third question, what are the most pressing issues facing racial minorities in Kansas City? I'd like to begin this round of questions with Bill. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. I think that the first thing that's important to understand about the issue of race is just how it connects with every other issue that we're dealing with as a society. It plays into disparities in education, it plays, it plays into uh, pay disparities between men and women. It's really, it's, it's, it's in our DNA as a city, unfortunately. And I say that as somebody who grew up here and as somebody whose family has been here for generations. For me, you know, there's 10 minutes worth of policy I could talk about, but with about 45 seconds left, I guess I would say that what's important to me as a, as a white man who had this great city, and I'm uniquely positioned because I'm at the intersection of race and gender. And as a parent, people ask me, how do, how do you stand out in this council race? It's very apparent how I stand out, right? <laughs> but it's also very apparent when I go to Costco, because just the other day when I went to get some items for an event, my treasurer was with me, and when we walked through, he said, you know, I only get stopped when I'm here with you. When I'm with my wife, you never get stopped with baskets full of stuff. That's an issue, right? This is a Costco. We're not in Westport going to a bar. We're going to get groceries. And so it's a real issue in our city, but we can't just keep talking about it. Where's the accountability? And so we have a great human relations department where we continue to cut their budget that is assigned to investigate and deal with these issues in the city. Uh, we have uh, opportunities for uh, people to be able to come together and have discussions but the real need is for us to come together and create opportunities for the people. And so when we talked about the WNDE ordinance recently, I was able to lead along with my council, well, council of Shields, for, to be able to get women and minorities to be able to get dual certification. Because at the intersection of race and gender, that is a double minority, a double barrier to success, and we gotta do more to create more opportunities. And so you asked about our leadership style. I absolutely agree with Phil that the first thing that we do is we listen. We listen and we bring all voices to the table. That are, there are several conversations that we have at City Hall that are very, very tough, they're very polarizing, and one of the things that we can do is no matter how many voices there are, that we bring everybody to the table, that we listen and we work together as a community. Because I found over and over and over again, if that you don't bring the most polarized voices to the table, you're not gonna make any progress. And so that's the type of leadership that I will st style that I have, and that's what I'll bring to this office. So I'll just be honest, because we're just among friends right now. Uh, a conversation in a room about race with a supermajority um, white audience is always kind of interesting, at least for me as a black person. Um, so, because it's kind of like, am I going to tell you what I really think, or will I tell you what white people kind of want me to make sound happy? Um, and I'll just say it this way. Fundamentally, the last question really did actually relate to race. I believe the reason that we have been so comfortable in Kansas City with the 1990s, since the 1990s, with an incentive policy that diverts money away from our public schools, is that fundamentally we kind of gave up on the majority black public schools. That's the real story. And I tell you what I've met with developers and others, and they say, well, this project's very important. In some ways, they're often kind of saying, and what's the school district going to do with that money anyway? And so I think when we talk about race, what we really need to talk about is how many of our policies have a deleterious effect on the quality of life of black people, Latinos, and so many others in this city every day. And we need to think about it deeply. I'll give, oh, I'm already at stop time, aren't I? Because I was just warming up. I'll tell you one last thing. Whenever we're doing things like Westport Street privatizations, we need to make sure that we're not just saying we're forgetting about the real impact of what that is on black men and women who are coming to Westport are going to be stopped more and be questioned more. I believe in collaboration, and I believe that we have to remember this all the time. I 
appreciated Quentin's comments uh, about being an African American man to a super majority white audience. Um, and I, somebody that's grown up as a white male has had every opportunity because I'm male and because I'm white. I also feel my own self of such self consciousness because I'm very conscious of those people that don't have what I have enjoyed. I want to add to what my colleagues said. I think not only do we need to be listening to one another, but we need to see one another and not look past one another. And that means not waiting for people to come to us because we're siloed. That means going out. And one African American minister I was talking to, he says, you know, the fact that we're segregated, he was very, very intentional. And the corollary I drew from that was that to reverse that, we have to be equally intentional. And that means going out and embracing everyone and seeing them. I was yesterday in St. James uh, uh, Baptist Church, or St. James Methodist Church, on a race issue. And John Gray, the judge, kind of closed with this, and it still sticks in my brain. He says the start to this is we have to expose one another, because exposure brings consciousness. Consciousness brings correction. Correction brings justice. And justice is the road to healing. So as mayor, I'm going to try to lead as best I can by example down that road of exposing all of us to the wonderful human beings and really seeing one another. So there's so much I can say, but I'm going to start with uh, kind of one of the last, one of the first questions that we actually was asked about racial profiling. Because as an African American male in this community, I have been racially profiled many times. And even here in Westport, where we are tonight, uh, I've been profiled trying to go to an establishment here in, in, this, in this area. And we got to have a real conversation. So I think to the first part of your question is that outside of listening, I think that we as a community have to stop and take a deep breath and be honest about this conversation because all of us have inherent biases that we really need to address. And as Councilmember Lucas started talking about, sure, as an African American man, I'm, I'm unapologetic about what I have to say about my experiences growing up in this community, about the things that I have experienced uh, from all walks of life that all of us need to be able to do. She's already at the stop point, but I'll tell you this, is that Mayor James has commissioned a, a conversation about race. And when you think about all of the things that are happening in this country, this isn't unique to Kansas City, folks. This is something that we have to address together as a community, as a society, and everyone in this entire world. I think about the quote about, from Martin Luther King about not just being judged by the color of your skin, but the, the content of your character, as I paraphrase. We need to really own up to that. And I think as Councilmember Kennedy was trying to steal some of my lines, we have to make sure that our rhetoric really does match our commitment. Okay, so, um, you know, with all that's going on in the world today, in Washington, D.C. especially, uh, Kansas City really should be that model city for how diverse communities work together uh, and are, uh, inclusive and diverse, and we celebrate it and embrace it. And so the next mayor uh, must be, uh, must really uh, understand that and uh, also be a good listener. That's really, I think, being an at-large member, I'm working on the committee I work on, I've worked with neighborhoods all over the city. Yeah, I don't do a lot of the talking in these meetings, but I do listen and try to come to some solution or compromise. And that's really, I think, a, a key skill set. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, when it comes to uh, inequities, that, because I, th I think we could talk about all the different inequities in, in more than a minute, it would take a long time, but uh, we had a, a financial inequity with small businesses. As we were trying to grow small businesses, we formed the Small Business Committee, did meetings outside the City Hall on Truce to uh, West Side, uh, invited in uh, diverse voices, took those ideas and created a micro loan program because we heard if, if you had a business in a certain zip code of the city, you had a hard time getting a bank loan. Uh, and we all know, you know the reason why sometimes. So uh, we set up our own program that was more flexible that didn't look at those, some of the things that traditional banks look at. We worked with the Obama administration 
I was invited to the White House a couple times because of the work we did as a committee and uh, actually spoke at the Democratic Convention about it. Be, and it was all about the inclusiveness and reaching out. Yeah, I'm sorry, I get off. I, I, I love talking about this, this issue. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so my name is Scott Wagner, and I want you to remember that talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. And what I mean by that is you can have every conversation in the world and our current mayor is having it. You might, for those of you who want to take the time machine back to about 12 years ago, uh, Councilman Jim Rowland and Troy Nash had these very same conversations back then, and yet we keep having the same conversation. Action is what is required, and what is that action? Uh, a few minutes ago I talked about how I helped start the real estate apprenticeship program for those African Americans to start getting them more involved in real estate development in this city. And the reason why we did it was because we were, I was at a meeting at the Federal Reserve and someone asked, why is it that people who look like me cannot be involved with all these big deals? And that's where we started having these conversations. And like I said, we've got two cohorts now, 40 people who are ready to do some things, both in the east side of this city as well as in the northeast side of Kansas City, Kansas. One other thing, in Rochester, New York, there is a program called Mosaic, and they bring together people from different walks throughout their city. And the whole point of that is to get people from different parts of the city talking about what is the same about them, getting real conversations going between real people. If we're going to get things going and changing the way the race is judged in this city, it means that we all have to participate. Action is required, and I want to bring that action. Thank you.